Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Anita Murjani. Welcome, Anita. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Anita is pretty well known, um, at least in certain circles, uh, as a result of a rather dramatic near-death experience um, she had, or maybe NDE we'll be calling it. She wrote a book called Dying to Be Me, and I read your book cover to cover. I also listened to about a dozen of your interviews, and I never got tired of the story. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you're not tired of telling it. You've probably told it thousands of times by now. <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm not tired of telling it, and I'm so happy you've read my book because the interview is actually a lot more fun. Uh, for me, it's a lot more fun when the person interviewing me has read my book. Well, yeah, I, I really I try to prepare as much as possible for these things, and I. I found your whole account to be fascinating and full of all kinds of interesting ideas that we can discuss. So I've really been looking forward to this, and as have many of my guests. In fact, some people send in questions they want me to ask you, so I'll, I'll be doing that too. Sure. So um, you're a, you're an old hand at telling the story. So why don't we just get right into it, and you can kind of give us an account of you know. Because many people who are listening to this won't have heard your story, even though, of course, some will be familiar with it. Yeah. Well, in um, 2002, I was diagnosed with cancer, with lymphoma. And over a period of four years, um, the cancer spread throughout my lymphatic system. And um, so by about 2000, early 2006, um, the cancer had spread. Basically, I had tumors all over my lymphatic system and swollen lymph glands from the base of my skull all around my neck, under my arms, my chest, all the way down to my abdomen. And um, on February the 1st, 2006, is when I went into a coma. And at that point, um, apart from all the tumors that had spread throughout my lymphatic system, I had open skin lesions. Um, I was breathing with the aid of an uh, oxygen tank. I had fluid in my lungs. Um, my, my muscles had completely deteriorated. And up to that point, I hadn't even been able to walk anymore. I used to get taken around in a wheelchair. And I constantly had a low-grade fever. And because my lungs were filled with fluid, um, I... I would constantly be coughing and choking. I couldn't even lie down flat. So I was in a tremendous amount of discomfort. And on February 2nd, 2006, I went into a coma, and my doctors had told my family that these were my final hours because my organs were now shutting down, and that's why I was in a coma. And um, so basically they said, the doctors said I wouldn't be coming out of the coma. And unbeknownst to everyone around me, though, even though it appeared that I was in a coma, I was actually aware of everything that was happening around me. And um, I actually felt really amazing. I felt really light and free. And for the first time, I felt healed and well. It was like all the pain had gone. All the fear and everything I'd been dealing with was just gone. And I just felt incredible. And I felt as though I was um, surrounded by um, beings that were taking care of me. But I also felt that I was just loved, unconditionally loved. And it was the first time I had felt this way in my entire life. And words can't even begin to do it justice to, to this experience because it was like for the first time, I didn't have to work at being loved. I didn't have to, I didn't feel as though I had to do anything to deserve it or be worthy of it. I was just loved just because I existed. And um, I became aware of my father who had passed away 10 years prior to this experience. And I, I felt, I sensed his essence um, his essence was there with me and it was like his essence and mine, it was like it just merged um, he was communicating with me but in that realm the communication is not like we have it here, it's not done with language or voice, 
it's like it's like we just merge with the essence of the other being and we become one and we just know everything that they want us to know instantaneously did you feel also, that in, when you're in that state did you feel like you had a body uh, like you say you felt so comfortable for the first time in a long time was there a sense of physical comfort or was it more just the, the comfort of being released from the, the miserable physical condition you had been in and you were in a sort of a disembodied spirit at that point yeah it's the latter mm -hmm. I didn't feel any, any physical body or anything even my communication um, there was no biology with which to communicate no voice um, I had no eyes so even though my awareness was not through physical eyes, it was like I had 360 degree peripheral vision, like I was aware of everything that was happening all around me, um, within, not just within that room, but beyond. So because I didn't have a physical body, it was almost like my consciousness was just expanding and expanding because it wasn't limited to a physical body. So I felt as though I was just expanding and expanding beyond that room, beyond the hospital building, and just continued to expand. As though, so it felt as though I could be anywhere and everywhere I wanted to be at the same time. Because so you, you I didn't even feel you didn't even feel like you had a subtle body. You were just a a, a, a being of awareness or something, and like you couldn't have you couldn't have lifted your hand up and looked at your subtle hand. It was just you were just intelligence or awareness or whatever that's what it felt like yes okay. yeah. yes and yet I was aware of me the body was lying there and I was aware that that there was this person that existed that was me and I was aware that there were other beings but it was like there was no where they ended and I began or where I ended and they began there was no separation mm. Interesting. So I kind of interrupted you. You were just saying that your father came to you, and I think you also mentioned in your book that your your best friend who had died of cancer also came to you in that state. So exactly. May, maybe please continue from there. Sure. So my father had passed away ten years prior, and so he um, so he came to me, and my best friend who had died, she had died of cancer two years prior to that, and I had missed her a lot, but also. In her final days, or final weeks actually, I hadn't gone to see her because um, because I had my own cancer diagnosis to deal with. So watching her deteriorate was very fearful for me. But at the same time, I knew she wanted me to be with her. So I had felt a lot of guilt um, for not actually being with her, not spending time with her in her final weeks. And when she finally died, I just felt this awful guilt and I'd been carrying that with me. But when I saw her in the other realm, um, you know, it was like all I felt from her was unconditional love. It wasn't even a forgiveness. It was like there was nothing to forgive. The feeling I got from her was like just total understanding. She completely understood why I had done what I'd done. And there was just total compassion, total empathy, total understanding. There was nothing to even forgive. Mm. And even with my father, I had felt that during my life I had let him down a lot because I didn't conform to a lot of his cultural expectations. And um, I'd always wondered how it would be, you know, whether I would... Uh, I would experience bad karma because of it and because of things I'd done, which in my culture are considered wrong. But all I experienced in the other realm was just nothing but unconditional love from my father, from generally, that's all I felt. I felt no judgment whatsoever. This may be a trivial question, but um, in its long lines of the one I just asked you, you say your friend came, your father came. How did you recognize them as your friend and, and your father? Did they have any sort of recognizable physical form, or was it really just a sort of an essence that would come and commune with you? It was purely the essence, and it just, the essence was in, it was unmistakable. It's everything from what they wanted me to know. It's like I became one with them, and so it was completely unmistakable that it was them. Mm -hmm. And even the type of messages they gave me was, exactly the kind of thing that I know they would say. 
and my father was very protective and he wanted me to know it wasn't my time my friend wanted me to know that I needed to go back and be more fearless and you know it, it was just so typical of a mm. and that probably wasn't uh, advice that you were totally enthusiastic about hearing c considering what you had to no. go back to in terms of a body <laughs> <laughs> exactly no I, I didn't want to come back at first absolutely didn't want to come back um, and and, you know, apart from the fact that my body was completely deteriorating, it was dying, there was no incentive to come back. But not only was I suffering in this body, but my whole family was because they had to take care of me. And so I, I didn't want them to suffer anymore as well. So I really didn't want to come back. But then um, I felt what I can only describe as like a state of complete clarity, like as though I just woken up into this feeling that everything made sense and I just understood. I understood why I got the cancer. I understood everything like as though I just understood everything in my life up to that point, how my life had got to be where it was at that point in time. And there was just this incredible clarity. And then I understood um, that we are supposed to be, that I was an amazing, magnificent being, but I had always denied it. I'd never realized it, and I'd always denied it. Um, I'd always made myself a doormat, made myself small so others could be big. I'd always um, been a people pleaser, and I realized that, that um, my purpose was really to come and be my magnificent self. And that's true for all of us. And I'd always denied it. And then and there was just such incredible clarity around even why I got the cancer. And then I realized that now that I knew all this, that if I chose to go back to my body, it would heal. Mm. Um, and of course, and that, a, that, that, of course, that flew in the face of everything that all the experts believed. And no one thought you stood a chance whatsoever of, of healing. Yeah. Exactly, because when I, when I did come back, well, it was at that point that my, my friend actually said, now that you know what you know, go back and live your life fearlessly. Yeah. And so when I, and my father was saying, it's not your time, so go back. And so I was feeling it from both of them that I needed to come back. And so when I did come back and I opened my eyes, and um, but a lot happened in the other realm, but time was... Um, time is very different in that realm and so a lot happened and even though I was only gone about 30 hours it feels like it was a lot longer mm. and uh, so when I did open my eyes uh, I um, everybody was really surprised and I healed really really fast the doctors just wouldn't wouldn't believe it they didn't even know what to write in my medical records <laughs> um. When you opened your eyes and regained consciousness, were you immediately cognizant of what you had just been through in terms of that marvelous experience, or did it take some days or weeks before it all began to come back to your memory? It took some days because when I first opened my eyes, it was like I, I had one foot on each side. I didn't even know I had been in a coma. Mm. And um, for example, one of the things that I um, that I saw from the other state was that, that I had actually, it was like I became aware that if I chose to come back into my body, um, I became, I, it was like I saw the doctor coming into the room and telling my family, we have good news, her organs are functioning again. And I actually saw that pan out if I chose to come back into life. And so when it actually happened, after I came out of the coma, um, when the doctor did come into the room and say, um, we have good news, your organs are functioning again, I actually said something to the effect of, didn't you say that already yesterday? I wow. thought this happened. And, and so my, you know, and everybody was looking at me as though, like, what's wrong with her? And I, and I, and I was actually saying to my husband and my brother, I said, but he came in yesterday and he said my organs are functioning and they said no he didn't and so it was like uh, it was so real for me what had happened and 
uh, and and so I I had been seeing what was about to happen and mm -hmm. also I was recognizing people and I was telling them conversations and I, I had no idea I was in a coma so when they were saying how did you hear this your eyes were closed or how did you recognize this doctor and I said really my eyes were closed they were saying you were in a coma and I had no idea I was in the coma I mean, not only that, but you saw your brother coming from India on an airplane, and you saw your husband yeah. talking to the doctor, you know, 40 yards like 40 down, feet the, down, yeah, 40 yeah. feet down the hall, and, you know, things that even, obviously, people in that same room wouldn't have been able to see, and yet you were cognizing all that. Yeah. 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 So everybody was, like, wondering what was going on, but it took me about, I think, about four or five days, and one evening... Um, I just, I just got really emotional, and, and it just the memory just start, started to flood. And the first thing I started to remember was that my, my dad was the one that sent me back and said, it's not my time, and just started to remember that. And then I remembered seeing my brother in the plane and thinking that um, I can't die yet because he's going to be really upset if he comes here and finds he's missed me. And so I just started... Um, I just started crying. I got really emotional, and my family was saying, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And I said, "Something happened and while I was in the coma. That's why I thought I was awake." And then I started to tell them. And then over the days, it just—I just started to tell them more and more. And I found that, um, you know, once you start talking about it, once I started talking about it, I realized how much had happened. It was like I could have gone on and on. Just so much had happened. Do you find that even now, years later, you keep uh, mining little nuggets from that experience? Things keep coming to your awareness that you hadn't even remembered? Yes. In fact, it's not just that. You know, I sometimes say a near-death experience is like a door that once you've opened it, you can't close it again. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, it's apart from what I learned there in that state, there's a lot more that just keeps on coming it's like a gift that keeps on giving and um and i the only way i can i can talk about this is by like using for example using metaphors or something if you imagine that you're going down a path like you're just going down a path and this is a set path the road is already paved a certain way and you're going to travel this road suddenly something happens like a near-death experience that completely changes you it completely changes you and it takes you on a tangent in a completely different direction than what you would have gone so what happens is that no matter how much time passes you never forget that because the more time passes the more different you are than the person you would have been had you been going the way you were going. So many times people say to me that, oh, that's, you know, it's happened a few years ago. Is the memory fading? Or, um, you know, how can you still get nuggets from it today because it happened all those years ago? But it's not like that. It's like you become a different person. And it's this new person that now thinks in a different way. And thinking is happening every day. and. Um, you know, like you're, we're constantly thinking, evolving, and growing all the time. We can't not be. But the direction in which I'm thinking, evolving, growing is a different direction from the direction I was going in before. So the person who I'm becoming every day is more and more different than the person who I was then. Yeah, it's neat. Because as the further I go down the path, I thought of path. a I thought of a metaphor as you were saying that. It's like. It's as if someone had been like physically paralyzed in a wheelchair and then somehow miraculously they got healed from that and you know became able to function physically they would have you know the whole lifetime ahead of them to learn new things to do with their muscles and their their limbs that they would never have been able to do in the wheelchair state you know so there's no el no end to the unfoldment of possibilities once that capability has been awakened 
Exactly. So if you say to that person, I mean, I don't mean you, but this is a question I get a lot, is that, oh, um, that incident happened six years ago. Is that memory fading? And that person would say, no, because I was in a wheelchair destined to be in a wheelchair for life. Now I'm not only walking, but I've started running, I've started climbing mountains. And, and so yeah. they're learning and they're growing in a whole different direction. That's yeah. exactly what I feel. Yeah, it's, I think I'll know, take up like, tennis and then maybe I'll learn to play the violin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. all, so they become a different person and who they're becoming is more and more different from the person they used to be. And that's what I've, I've been finding exactly that. You know, it's like everything to do with, um, the way we think about fears, about illness. And so because as I go into this new direction, which is very different, I'm thinking differently. So I have new information, new growth, new new things that I'm learning and realizing every single day. Yeah. Um, do you, having had that huge contrasting experience between the ordinary world that we live in and the world that you had a glimpse of, um, when you look around you, walk around and live your life, do you see everyone as being like in some kind of dream state, uh, you know, the vast, vast majority of people? You know, there's that phrase in the Bible, we seeing through a glass darkly. I mean, does it, does it, do you feel like you're living in a world of, of dreamers uh, and that you know, the vast majority of people have no idea whatsoever that there is a much bigger reality that's just right under their noses, but they... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I exactly feel that way. And I and I see the way people um, buy into things, you know, like they believe things. Like, for example, just to give you a random example, when I was in the States, I noticed there's ads on TV about cancer, about getting cancer checkup. And these ads are all fear-driven, where they say one in three people are going to get cancer by the year 2013 or something and so go and get your early detection blah 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 and I'm listening to it thinking oh my god you know it's like it's as though I feel as though all these things I feel as though I can see right through it and I know there are many people out there who are going to disagree with me but I'm sorry that this is the way I see the world now I feel that all, all this cancer awareness is what is causing more and more cancer and was, that's the way I see it now I was thinking about that and you know because I've been reading your book and everything about how fear is such a powerful cause of cancer but I was thinking well geez you know certainly that's one category of cancer but obviously there are other things which would definitely tend to cause it such as heavy smoking or exposure to radiation or certain chemicals or even a genetic predisposition I mean the one of the Miss America contestants has decided to have a double mastectomy because there's such a history of breast cancer in her family um, so could you almost categorize cancer into, you know, there's definitely the fear category, which was your case, fear and, and worry, but then there are other things which are quite um, maybe exacerbated by fear, but which definitely predispose one to getting it, irrespective of one's attitude. Um, okay, so I, first, um, I won't put the blanket statement of fear applying to everybody, although it applied to me. So totally, I agree with you on that, that I don't think everybody gets cancer because of fear. But I think that in terms of other cases, like genetic and so on, I think it's far less so than what we think. I think many of us are afraid that we will get it because our uh, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, a sibling had cancer. I don't actually think, um, and this is my personal opinion, I don't think we get cancer genetically. I think that it's not a physical thing. It's because we have seen it, um, we are aware of it, we are talking about it, breathing it, every day being told that um, so-and-so had it, our aunt had it, our mother had it, our sister had it, oh my God, I'm so scared, I'm going to get it, I'm going to, get it. I'm going to have a double mastectomy. Um, I don't see cancer that way. That's the, that's the issue I, I have, is that I don't see cancer as a physical disease anymore. Mm. And I'm unable to see it as a physical disease because I saw, experienced, even so I experienced physically how quickly it just reversed itself just because 
shift took place internally, and even the doctors couldn't explain it. Cancer is not an exact science. Um, as much as we like to think we're closer to a solution, I don't actually believe the solution will be in medicine. And that tells me I don't believe it. After what I experienced, I view cancer completely differently from your average person and probably more so than from your average oncologist. I really do. And I can't view it in the way other people do. After what I've been through, I just can't. Well, I can see why you couldn't, and, and your case is very convincing. I mean, if you can reverse cancer, if, if, a, if a person whose cancer was as advanced as yours was could turn it around, then certainly someone whose mother happened to have it and whose grandmother happened to have it, you know, shouldn't necessarily go having mastectomies. I mean, they, there seems to be something they could do on a spiritual level or whatever that would pretty much eliminate the possibility. I think that it's this constant awareness of... You know, when we start to feel that, oh, the cancer is so close, my mother had it, my sister had it, it's this constant awareness of cancer, this fear of cancer that just kind of brings it into our awareness, into our energy all the time. It's not the actual genes for the DNA. It's not that. In fact, um, there's somebody who I admire, and it's, it, it, uh, after this experience happened to me, and I was talking about it in this way, the way I'm talking about it, you someone actually told me you've got to look up Bruce Lipton and and when I did I understood completely why because he's actually proven using science that it's not in the genes even when we think something is genetic it's not mm. it's the he says it's the environment and what he means by that is that not the physical environment but the emotional environment and 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 it, and it was interesting. I thought, my wow, what he does and what he says dovetails completely into what I say. Also, genetics are a lot more malleable than scientists once thought. <laughs> you know, yes. the, the DNA can change and all that. <laughs> yeah, and and um, I think also that we we're not giving enough attention or research into how our emotions affect our bodies and and open up our immune systems to allow cancer cells to um, you know proliferate so so we're not we're actually not even looking in that direction all of the money is being spent on purely on medical research on medicine on how to kill the cells but at the same time we're killing all the healthy cells as well nobody is looking at why are we getting cancer what's triggering it mm -hmm. and i think that in fact we have so many cases of people. It, actually, after I wrote my book, um, then uh, I cannot tell you the number of emails I received, certainly not hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of emails from people who have had cancer who have said to me that, do you know, I have always suspected that it's my emotions that triggered my cancer. Oh. So many people have said, you know, you have written my story. Still, to, to play devil's advocate, because I, I, I can't completely shed this notion, I mean, obviously there are statistical probabilities of, among smokers of getting cancer. And there was this uh, situation near Buffalo, New York called Love Canal some decades ago where a huge percentage of people in the area got cancer, and it was discovered that there had been some chemical emissions that had been going into the water supply. I mean, so there still are things like that, you know. Uh, which So you can't just say that... The, the psychological component alone is the only factor. I mean, no. It, yeah. I would never say that. On the one hand, absolutely, I would never say that. I don't advocate smoking because I don't smoke myself. I never have. I don't advocate smoking. But just in response to the playing, again, playing devil's advocate with you, um, why is it that there are some smokers who can live to be 90 and live to be completely healthy, whereas some get lung cancer? The other thing is that even where you have what you were mentioning, let's say if there's radiation from a chemical plant or something that affects people, um, again, not everybody in that area will get cancer, only some. Why would that be? Some of us have a weaker constitution, and I actually think that our emotions contribute to whether we have a stronger or a weaker con a constitution. And I think that there's not enough emphasis uh, played on, not enough emphasis is given to that in our upbringing as children. When we grow up, we're not encouraged to actually 
um, have stronger self-esteem and a stronger belief system in our own physical ability to heal. And I think that also plays a part. That's a good point. I mean, some people might argue, for instance, that some smokers don't get cancer because, you know, they're on the edge of the bell curve of people who have stronger constitutions but by, or maybe genetically superior situation. But, you know, they're thinking just in terms of the physical, whereas you would say that, you know, a good many of those people, if not all of them, perhaps might have a different um, emotional or psychological orientation, yes. which kind of protects them against it. Yeah, I, I think that has a lot to do with it as well. I, I really do because my own emotional makeup has changed from before I had cancer to after. So I'm looking, so I'm just kind of projecting, I'm just saying this is what happened to me. It may be the case for you or anyone. So I kind of put out there, this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you relate to it, great. I hope this can help you. But of course, um, I'm not saying to people that it's okay to go up and so I don't smoke myself and sure. or, or to live near a chemical plant or anything like that. <laughs> Why handicap yourself? You know? Yeah, or handicap. Yeah, exactly. Um, one question I had while reading your book and listening to your interviews, which relates to what we're talking about, and somebody else actually sent it in yesterday, wanting me to ask it, is, you know, if the psychological component, fear or lack of it, is so instrumental in, in determining whether or not we're going to get cancer. How is it that some great saints have gotten cancer, like Ramana Maharshi, who arguably was completely free of fear and, and living in a state of bliss and grace, but yet even he got cancer? It may have been his time and his way, because I can't guarantee, even myself, even being through everything I've been through, I can't guarantee that I won't get cancer again, and I won't say that. Um, I'll never say that, oh, I'm never going to get cancer again. All I do know is that I would handle the cancer very differently. Um, I know what caused my cancer that time, and I know it's because one is because of fear and the other is because I just didn't love myself enough. And I know that when you love yourself more, it does make you a healthier person. What we don't know, even with the greatest saints, one thing we don't know is what is their what is their inner things or their inner self talk like are they still insecure inside do they love themselves do they not so not to undermine any of them but if I were to get cancer again I would uh, I would feel that maybe this is my time and this is my way out because it could be even something that um, happens for my benefit to it's like um a way out to leave this world and it could be something that even teaches something to the people around me but I don't see even the cancer that I had before I don't see it as like people say oh you've had cancer the or cancer re nearly killed you and I say no uh, I see that cancer as a gift to save my life and I don't know how we all have to exit the world at some point I don't know how I'm going to exit next time. It might be cancer might come and save me. Because, um, again, if I can also add, I don't see death as a bad thing. Um, I don't see it as a bad thing at all. I think that, in fact, it's wonderful. I feel the people who died are very blessed and they've gone on because people say, why did it happen to me? And, you know, their loved ones didn't come back. Maybe their loved ones are the lucky one and the blessed ones that got to go onward and I was sent back because I still have things to do. So if, if cancer is what, is, uh, is what I manifest as a way out, then that's, that's what it is. That's I would accept it. Interesting point. I've, I've listened to and read a lot of NDEs over the years, you know, Danny and Brinkley and Betty Eady and James Von Prague, and now, of course, even Alexander is very much in the news these days. And uh, you, you get the feeling from all of them that, the, the fear of death has been completely wiped out because they had such a sublime experience. You even get the sense that maybe they're kind of looking forward to it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've had my moments where I've kind of thought, oh my God, why did I come back? <laughs> yeah. Because it's life is a little denser and heavier and slower. Um, you know, and it's like in that realm, there's this 
when I came back, I was like so euphoric. I still had that feeling. But then, of course, once you're back in life, there are there are times when there are obstacles and there are things that frustrate you. And so, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's incredible in another realm. Let's talk about that density point a little bit. I, th I find that very fascinating. Um, you know, how how dense the world is, or appears to be anyway, and how sucked into it we get. You know, because presumably before we come here, we're all in that realm, and then we, we come, a little baby, we're born, and the density just kind of takes over and over and over. By the time you're a teenager, you're really in the thick of it, you know, and uh, it seems like... Yeah. Maybe you can talk about this. In my notes here, I have life's true purpose, but it seems to me that the name of the game is, while in the density, rediscover the, you know, the sublime level of life and then be able learn to live them both together. Yeah, in fact, it's, um, it's important to be grounded here because um, I think some people feel that they need to escape this density, but I think the best thing we can do is to be grounded here, but also not take life seriously and and have and be able to access this sublime level, this subliminal level. Um, one of the things that there's so many things that that I, I talk about, uh, uh, you know, as to how to do this or how to achieve this. Um, one of them is that I actually tell people to stop setting goals, chasing, competing, pursuing. That's what keeps us in this density level, is this constant feeling of needing to compete with others to get ahead, this constant comparing ourselves with others. That, again, keeps us in this density and this feeling of frustration. Like, if we talk about teenagers, why do they feel so insecure all the time? Because they're constantly comparing themselves. So I think one of the things we need to learn and we need to teach our children is that it's not important to compare yourself with other people. It's not important to compete or to get ahead or to chase or to pursue. All you have to do is be yourself. It's to just go, um, just go into self-discovery and discover who you are and express who you are and express who you are with abandon. Like, don't be afraid to be yourself. From the time that we're children, and again, this is why we get caught up in the density, from the time that we're children, we're actually taught to conform. And this is actually what keeps us in that dense energy because we're trying to conform, we're trying to gain people's approval. Again, gaining people's approval, that keeps us in that density. The other realm is so liberating and freeing. What we feel in the other realm it's like a feeling of um, that I just have to be who I am. I don't, I just have to allow. It's a real freeing feeling. There's no feeling of needing to do anything, chasing, pursuing. Um, there's no that. And all of that stems from fear, this competing, chasing, uh, comparing. All of that stems from fear, fear of not being good enough, not having enough. And once that's gone, we actually are touching that level, that level that we experience in the near-death experience. But let's say that you're a young person and you have the aspiration to be a doctor. Now, mm -hmm. you've really, you're going to have to work really hard in school and, and get good grades, and, and medical school is very competitive. Only a handful are going to get in. So there is this sort of competitive mentality that you're almost – necessarily caught up in how would you advise a young person to approach that so as not to violate what you just advised I would ask the young person whether they want to be a doctor because they're passionate about being a doctor is it something that they want to do or are they wanting to be a doctor because they because it appears to be a good um, a good job because they want to um, you know from this from the point of view of like it's um they want the job security they want the money they want the status are they doing it because of the status so they can appear to be a winner compared to all their other friends who have lesser jobs or are they doing it because they passionately want to be a doctor that's what i would ask them and if the, it's 
because of the status and the money and all, I would actually advise them to find something else. That's a good answer because obviously if you're passionate about it, then you're doing it because you love it. You're not, you're, not exactly. com you're not competing with your fellow students. You're just absorbed in what you enjoy. Exactly, and that's what I tell people to do. If you do what you enjoy doing, you will do it well anyway. You don't, you don't, nobody needs to tell you to study hard or work hard. Hmm. That's great. Um, okay, let's talk about God a little bit. Uh, I have a sure. note here where you say, God isn't a being but a state of being, and I was now that state of being. So... You know, Would obviously, you like me? Yeah, yeah, you can just, I'm sure you can riff on that. <laughs> yeah, easily. When we're in this um, physical world, because we're physical beings, we, we call this a world of duality. And what duality means, means a separation. There's good and bad, negative, positive, hot, cold, um, war, peace, and so on. But it also means that, that, that we're separate, we're physical. You know, you your physical body is separate from my physical body. When we are not expressing from our physical bodies, your essence, your consciousness, and my consciousness are actually one. You and I are one, um, and our consciousness are one. Everybody out there, when we're not expressing through our physical body, at our consciousness, there's no separation. There's no separation between you and me. Or, um, or me and anyone else, or Obama, or Mother Teresa, or Hitler. There's no separation between any of us because we all share the same consciousness. So when we're without our body, there's no separation between me and God. But when we are in our bodies, we feel the separation, you and me, or whether it's a Hindu, a Christian, a Muslim, we feel we're all separate. And we feel that any kind of guidance or help or what we pray to we feel that even that is something separate when we're not in our bodies there's no separation it's all one it's a state of non-duality so even god is not a being that is separate from you and me we're all merged we're all one and that is the state of god it's a state of being now of course um you know if religions say that God is omnipresent and if he's omnipresent then there's no iota of creation where he which he doesn't permeate already uh, yeah. and so really in reality we're not separate we can't be separate right yes and, and exactly. now, now being in the body doesn't is not necessarily a, a sentence of separation because we we hear of saints who are God realized and presumably they've uh, learned to appreciate the essential unity of everything well in a body um, yeah I, I imagine that to a great extent that has become your experience I'm sure you don't feel the sense of separation that you once felt there must be a great deal of unity or oneness or something yeah so um, when you've had such an experience you lose that sense of separation and this is why I say that there's no separation between us and what we call God. We think we think we're separate. So even we think you and I are separate. We think you're separate from Buddha or Jesus or Krishna, but we're not. We're absolutely not. We are all expressions of this consciousness. And the more that people realize that, I mean, if we were to teach our kids at school that we are actually not separate, that we are all one, we're all the same. If we were to teach that, um, and if we were to teach them to collaborate with each other, because we're all part of the same one, rather than to compete, we'd have a very, very different race of people. We'd have a different planet. Mm. You don't sound like you're much of a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> Along the lines of this density discussion, I was listening to the radio yesterday and someone was um, referring to a Scientific American article in which the author mentioned that if it were not for our delusion really that we are separate beings, there actually would be no sense of time. It's somehow our, mm -hmm. se our separateness that gives us the whole concept of time. And you talk in, in your book about your experience in, in realizing that everything is really happening simultaneously. There is no past, present, or future. And I find that fascinating, and I kind of think that it, it 
in many ways, you know, our, our dense physical structure serves as a filter uh, and just as a prism breaks light into you know the various colors, uh, the, this filter of our physical being uh, it takes you know one whole reality and breaks it into fragments. One of those fragments being time, and it seems like that's necessary in order to function in the world. But yes. it, it gets you know you can't book a plane ticket if you don't have a sense of time. <laughs> but it gets it gets the upper hand, doesn't it? Yes. In fact, what's happened is that we allow time to rule us rather than the other way around, when in actuality, time seems to be a, a brain or a mind function. And in the other realm, it really was as though there was no time, or maybe instead of no time, maybe a better description would be all of time existed at the same time. Every point in time existed all at the same time. So what I perceive, what I could interpret as past lives, felt as though they were happening simultaneously, right there at the same time. And um, what I perceived as future events, like even seeing the doctors come in with the results and seeing that my body was healing very rapidly, all of that felt like it was happening then and there simultaneously at the same time. So there was no separation, no differentiation. And interestingly, it's both time and space. So space was, um, uh, I was not separated from other things or other people by space. It was like I could be anywhere and I could be at any time. So there I was seeing my brother getting a plane in India, and then I was in Hong Kong watching my family around my body. So space didn't matter, time didn't matter. I was perceiving what appeared to be past life with my brother, um, future, what was panning out with my life. So space and time, all of that just didn't seem to matter. Hmm. Interesting. So if reincarnation really is the way it works, um, then on some level, right now as I'm having this conversation with you, I'm also a washerwoman in India and a soldier in Germany and a, yes. you know, a caveman or whatever, <laughs> whatever I've been. Uh, that's all, all those lives are somehow being lived simultaneously. Yes, and I believe when people have what we call past life regression therapy or memories, they're not actually, actually accessing that something that happened in the past. They're able to access it because it's happening right now. And that's why we're kind of able to access these memories because so they're happening right now. And, and also um, the whole perception of all of time and all of space existing at once, and it, it's quite confusing for people. So I use the metaphor of tapestry. So if you imagine like a huge tapestry that's really, really complex where the picture is a very complex picture with lots of different colored threads woven through. Now imagine if you, your life is one of the threads, one of the colors woven through, and your, your life isn't over yet. Um, so, you, so you are somewhere along that thread, but the rest of the thread still continues yet to, uh, yet to be lived. So imagine if you're in a near-death state where you are now not that thread, but you are out of that and looking at the whole tapestry. So you see the whole tapestry completed, which means you see all the other threads um, and you see the completed picture. Uh, you see your thread, your life. You see everybody who you've touched and everybody who you've yet to touch. You see all the people around you, the parallel, the simultaneous lives, um, and you see it all woven into this perfect tapestry. You're in the state where you can see everything as though from the outside looking in and you see the whole completed picture and you see how it all fits in. But when you're living your life, you're one thread in that tapestry. And so you're, and, and so, but from this near death state, it's, you're seeing all of time and all of space all at once. But when you're that thread, you're traveling along that one thread. You can't see all the distance of all the other colors and all the threads. It's, it's all a distance away. That's kind of how I try and explain it. Yeah, that's a good metaphor. And the thread view is very compelling. You know, I mean, we, we, we're just sucked into 
there's, a, there's a, like a gravity or a, a magnetism that kind of sucks us into the individual perspective over and over and over again. Uh, but yeah. I, I, I kind of, and, and someone like yourself had such a huge shift that it, you know, it's, it's irreversible to a great extent. But the average per I was just talking with someone yesterday in a store, and I was saying I was going to interview you, you and, and she says, well, how about the rest of us? You know, we can't all have these near-death experiences. And, and I thought, well, I said, well, you know, maybe somebody like Anita is like Columbus. You know, he, he, all of Europe couldn't come over to discover America, so he went with a few guys in a few little ships, and then they came back and told everybody about it. And now, you know, then over the centuries, more and more people came, and now we, people go back and forth every, every day. It's become kind of commonplace. So maybe, maybe Anita is like a pioneer, and as a society, we need to find ways of discovering this deeper dimension without having to almost die. <laughs> so that it can become more and more the norm and then what a wonderful world we might have that's exactly what i'm hoping because when people say what's your what's the purpose of you sharing the story or telling people what happened and i say it's exactly that it's so that people don't have to go through what i went through um to to realize the gifts that life is because one of the things that i i realized was that life is truly a gift and i didn't realize it until after I came back that this is a gift to be able to experience it and one of uh, and the other thing is uh, what I can see now so clearly which of course I couldn't before because I was in it too you know we talk about that one thread when you're sucked in when you're that one thread you can't see how everybody's living we are all living in fear many 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 of us are living in fear and we can't see it every single day our decisions as we from the time we wake up in the morning our decisions are made from a place of fear and what i mean by this is that we fear the consequences every job we take just like i said we were talking about the kid who wants to be a doctor is he making that choice out of fear or out of passion so most of us choose our um, choose our major in school out of a fear because we want to get ahead. We choose our jobs out of a fear, our careers, we choose it out of fear um, because we want to compete, we want to be number one, we want to get ahead. And everything, even our the way we choose our health care, the, product, the products we use, the foods we eat, we, we fear the chemical content in them. We get a double mastectomy because we fear cancer. So we all live our lives, we become a race that is fearful. We make our choices out of fear. Now imagine if you made every single choice in your life from a place of love, love for yourself, love for your life, love for the people around you, a passion or a reverence for life. So every food you ate, you chose it because you wanted it, you loved it, or you knew it was good for you because you want health. Um, everything, every job you chose, every career you chose, it was because you, you're passionate about it, um, and so on. Your life would look completely different. The planet would look completely different. Uh, so, so this is one of the things that, that um, I want people to know, is mm. that most of us are unaware. It's like we're asleep, and we're just being told by people that, advertisers of big companies that you need to fear this, you need to fear that, and we do, we all fear it. We just follow like sheep. Mm. There's a line in one of the Upanishads that goes, certainly all fear is born of duality. And uh, my interpretation of that is that, you know, if you're in a, a dual state, if you're in a, a state of separateness, you're necess there's necessarily going to be a fear as the foundation from that of that, even though you might not be constantly aware of it, but there's this underlying foundation of fear because you're estranged from your true nature. Yeah, and I, you know, and the thing is that I question as to whether it has to be that way. Well, hopefully we can all, I mean, hopefully we're moving into an age where it, it isn't that way, um, yeah. f you know, ordinarily. Um, it has been that way predominantly for you know, most of recorded history, but, it, it, you know, a lot of people are optimistic that we're going to turn that around pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty optimistic. One thing I loved in your book... Um, it was towards the end you were talking about um, you used the words 
uncertainty and ambiguity and I think paradox also maybe uh, which are some of my favorite words <laughs> the, the, uh, maybe you can you, you kind of know where I'm going with this because you, you have yes. it in your book but maybe you can talk a little bit about those you know yes, sure. that, that way of thinking okay so um, what I was talking about in, in my book is that most of us have this need for certainty. Again, that's a fear. But when we have this need for certainty, and, and this applies to even, you know, uh, when, even when it comes to our health or when it comes to our work, when it comes to the economy, we have this need for certainty. This need for certainty is actually a form of control. And with this need for certainty, we actually limit our experiences. When we need the certainty, we limit our experiences to only what we can imagine to be so, because we say, this is what we want, I need this, I need this to feel secure. And so we limit our experience to what we need it to be. But if we can get, if we can let go of this need for certainty, and if we can get comfortable with living in ambiguity and living in this state of not needing to know, not needing to control, not needing things to be a certain way, we'll actually realize that we can experience a lot more gifts and a lot more synchronicities and we can even watch a life unfold before us that can be even greater than what we imagine. Because I actually believe that we as human beings are capable of being and doing things much, much greater than we give ourselves credit for. Most of us suffer from low self-esteem. We're capable of much more. Um, and we limit ourselves. And because of our lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, we then need certainty. And then we control things. And we control them to bring them to a place that we feel comfortable with in our lack of self-esteem. But if we were told from the time we're young, if we constantly were told and believed that we are very capable of greater things and greater things do happen, and if we were more able to get into this place of trust, trusting in the universe, trust the gifts of the universe, what we would find is that actually the life that unfolds before us would be much greater than the one that we create if we're constantly trying to control the outcome because of our need for certainty. Mm. I once heard humility defined as the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way. Um, That's a good one. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> and yeah. uh, this is an interesting theme. You know, there's that bumper sticker, let go and let God. Uh, there's, yeah. I, I, and I think that the points you brought out about fear and, and control, <sighs> If I think you know people want, it's it's like there's a misapprehension of who's really calling the shots when when we exert excessive individual control over events which are in reality beyond our control. Uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a lack of trust uh, in the grace of life, in the deeper intelligence of life, and yes. you know if that if that trust can be awaken somehow cultivated and, and we could just relax a little bit <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know let the universe can do what it's doing anyway and, and just begin to become an uh, you know a, a willing participant rather than trying to be the taskmaster life will go much more smoothly yes i absolutely agree because i think one of the things that people have got confused again this is a of a dichotomy that people have got it confused is that we're being encouraged to take our power back and I agree with that you know it's don't give your power away to other people otherwise they can control you I totally agree don't give your power away to other people because when you have your own power you don't in fact when you feel powerful you don't control others and you don't allow others to control you but at the same time that you don't have to give your power to other people I do encourage people to surrender and there's a huge difference between surrendering and giving giving your power away when you surrender you're surrendering to universal energy we can call it universal energy source energy god whatever makes people feel comfortable so when you surrender to this greater part of yourself or the connection to the all that is what happens is that you allow this universal energy 
to flow through you. And the life that it creates is something far greater than what you could create if you were in this state of controlling. So when I say take your power back, take it back from other people, but it doesn't mean now hold it close to your chest and control your life and, and feel that you need certainty. It means take it back from, don't give your power to other people, but do give it universal energy and allow it to flow through you. Which is obviously infinitely more powerful than any individual expression of, of power. I exactly. mean, we, we, we might think of people like Napole Napoleon or Hitler or somebody as having been powerful people, but probably they were very insecure people, you know, feeling like they needed to sort of amass personal power because there, was a, there must have been a deep disconnect uh, with that universal energy yes. you're talking about. Exactly. The clue that they're not powerful people is their need to control others. Mm -hmm. If you truly are powerful, you have no need to control others. If somebody has a need to control others, they're not actually powerful. They're actually insecure and they're overcompensating. Yeah, I was watching this, t this uh, TV show about what was called the Little Ice Age, which was this climatic period that lasted hundreds of years where the weather got much colder, and they talked about how that really defeated Napoleon. He went into Russia with 600,000 troops and came back to France with 4,000. And, uh, you know, what would France have done with Russia? You know, what, what, what was going through his head? <laughs> <laughs> Why would they want to control that country so far away and so different? <laughs> there was yeah. kind of a sickness in the mentality. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk in your book about karma, punishment, and judgment. Let's talk about those a little bit, you know, because, you know, so many religions have concepts of heaven and hell, and New Age people have ideas about karma and what's going to happen to those who do bad things and so on. So what do you say? Well, I, I didn't experience any judgment whatsoever in the other realm, only absolute compassion. And my understanding is that I completely understood that even things that we do which are considered wrong in this realm, we do it because of where we are at at that point in our lives. And we do it from our own pain. We do it from our own suffering. Somebody who is totally self-fulfilled and happy and living a joyous life would never hurt other people. So um, those who are in pain, it's inevitable that they will cause pain because they are in pain themselves. There isn't more judgment and punishment waiting for them in the other realm. Because so how, how do we learn then? How does the, does the rapist get raped in the next life or the murderer get murdered? I mean, how does the balance get rectified and how does the person who is misbehaving change their ways if there's no sort of feedback or you know blowback from certain types of behavior as soon as you feel as soon as I felt that level of compassion when I felt that level of compassion and love for me there is no part of you that would want to hurt or rape anyone or anything you just a loved and fully unconditionally loved person would uh, who learns to love themselves who realizes that their life their presence is a gift would not hurt anyone they would all they would want to do is share that goodness with everyone around them so if there's no karma or judgment and if god is a loving and just god then how do you account for the people who go through such miserable things, you know, people starving and getting hacked with machetes and just all the terrible things that happen in this world? Why is that happening to those people? Uh, it's part of the duality of this world that we live in. It's just the way it is. It's the perceived separation that we all have for each other. One day, if everybody were to wake up and realize that we are all one, it wouldn't exist anymore. There would be no more starving people, no more capitalism, no more competition. We're not there yet. We're not there. We're not, but in terms of where we are, I mean, one person is born in a nice wealthy family and is fed well and loved and receives a nice education. The other person is born and, and is kidnapped and forced into prostitution or something. There, yeah. How do you account for the... Uh, you know, the difference in the fates of those two souls. It's part of the duality. It's just part of the duality. There is good, there is bad, there is negative, there is positive. 
and it would we're all in it together they're all part of us that prostitute is is the same consciousness as you are and me are the the perpetrator as well as the victim we're all part of one the same consciousness the same reality creating this duality if we were to all wake up it wouldn't exist and and so the idea is to wake people up but um but the idea of having somebody punish you when you think about this imagine if the only thing keeping you from killing someone is the fear of the afterlife wouldn't it be better to touch people to wake up to a different consciousness or to wake up to feeling empathy for other people rather than for them to do good because they fear the afterlife that has, um, all that does is bring more fear and the whole point the whole reason our uh, our race is the way it is is because there's so much fear everything we do the reason why people act out the reason why people kill the reason why people compete and chase and rape is out of fear out of fear of not having enough not being enough not doing enough what we need to do is to touch people to empathize not to fear the afterlife not to fear religion or to fear god or to fear punishment or retribution we have jails and all here already to put people behind bars if they are doing those things but we need to touch people so that they feel empathy so they realize that we're all one that what i you know what i feel you feel as well yeah no i i totally agree I'm just a little puzzled on the philosophical point of, you know, I agree that fundamentally we're all one soul, we're all one consciousness, but then we have these individuated expressions. Um, you know, you have your bank account and I have mine. You're, uh, you, uh, you're probably not going to empty it out and give it to me just because I say, hey, we're all one. Uh, so, you know, as individual souls, do we kind of bounce around arbitrarily from the good life to the horrible life and this and that to have to just to collect a variety of experiences, or do we chart the course of our destiny in a particular in a particular See, direction the Go thing ahead. is your question is rooted in linear time there's yes. a linear time it's all happening all at once you mm -hmm. probably have lifetimes running right now where you're um a starving soul in you know in a a poverty-stricken country you might be having a lifetime where you're a prostitute and you might be having a lifetime where you're a, a perpetrator of something so mm -hmm you know we're, it's in linear time that we're talking about punishment and so on you could be having all of those experiences right now just as part of your experience hmm. interesting huh. and I guess from a God's eye view you know God wants to have this to anthropomorphize God wants to have this variety of experience just for the sake of diversity in play there's just such a diversity of creation obviously that God seems to love that you know and you have to have if you're going to have hot you have to have cold so naturally exactly. there are these there are these polarities exactly huh. it's interesting here's a question that somebody wrote in um knowing what you know now in terms of the importance of self-love and being authentic what would you advise other women to do if faced with a traditional family that is trying to force them to conform to cultural norms such as being submissive or agreeing to an arranged marriage if it is not in their hearts to do so are there instances where deciding to become estranged from one's parents is actually the most self-loving thing that one can do if the parents are unrelenting in trying to force their views upon a child I think this is something that really um, a person has to ask themselves because one thing I never do is I never give answers to people because um, I don't think anybody has the right to give someone else an answer to questions like that because it she would have to I feel for her and I empathize with her but she would have to live with her decision she would really have to live with her decision so she has to ask herself which she want to separate from them what can she live what is the choice that she can live with but whatever choice she chooses I would still say that in whatever limited capacity that she is able to I would encourage her to still do whatever she can to find her joy and do what makes her feel joyful in that whatever condition she's 
whatever situation she's, she finds herself in, um, to, to actually still um, learn to love herself, respect herself. And I've found that the more that we love ourselves and respect ourselves, the more the people around us love us. In her case, it'll be very important for her to learn to do this, whether it's through meditation or through reading or spending time alone the more that she realizes or connects with that God consciousness part of her to feel self-empowered so that she knows that it's not just a doormat, the more she will see that the family who she's married into or her, her parents will treat her with that respect that she feels for herself. Mm, that's a good answer. Um, and even in your own case, obviously, you uh, before you were the new improved Anita, you resisted uh, arranged marriage and finally met the right guy, you know, so exactly. and without, you know, totally alienating your family, you managed to steer, to do it. <laughs> yes, and so if you follow your heart, like if she followed her heart, and nobody can tell her what to do, if she follows her heart, she will find that whatever choice she makes will be the correct one. If she's meant to stay with her family, um, that is the stronger heart feelings she will get. If she's meant to break away from them and find her own way, then she will feel the pull to go in that direction. So she really has to ask herself and listen to what mm -hmm. it says and not figure it out in her head as to the, these are the consequences, these, if I do this, this, if I do this. It's really about getting into that heart space. Can I deal with it if I go this way? Yeah, that's a very good answer. I mean, that answers all such questions in one fell swoop, you know, because obviously you can't get into the, the nitty-gritty of everybody's lives and figure out what they should do, but if you go down to that more fundamental level, it's going to, they're going to be able to answer it themselves. Yeah, and, yeah. and I would rather they answered it. Yeah. Um, here's another one from her. Um, now that you truly, viscerally know that you are the oneness, the all that is, how does this impact your day-to-day -day life? Do you still feel confined to your limited human reference point as Anita, or are there significant amounts of time in each day where you experience yourself as one with all life? I think I experience myself a lot as one with all of life because I, um, I don't worry about things anymore. I don't worry about how my life is going to turn out or what's going to happen from day to day, or, or I don't worry about my future. I just allow it to pan out because I know that I'm connected to everyone, connected to universal source energy, and if I don't, if I don't try to control it, if I don't try to fight it, what it has in store for me, I know I'm not going to be disappointed. Mm. I just allow, I allow it to unfold. Are you aware of uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, who recently hit the news with his ND? Yep. Yeah. Have yeah. You, been, have you been in touch with him? Or? Yeah. Yes, I have. We we've, okay. we've been in touch. With, we've been in touch with each other for the last year or so, even before he hit the news. We were supposed to be speaking together in March earlier this year, but then I had to do another event for Hay House, and so I couldn't show up. But we were so. Then we were trying to do another event together, and then his book hit the you know, hit, hit the New York Times, and then he got really busy. So yeah. Yeah. One thing uh, I noticed about him when I listened to his interview with Oprah uh, about a week ago was that he said that, you know, you know his whole story and probably many people do yeah. too. He, he was this uh, neurophysiologist who was sort of a, a materialistic agnostic and he had this profound near-death experience and ended up completely shifting his perspective as you have. Uh, but he said that ever since then, he spends two or three hours a day in meditation and he has d deep access to uh, that level in his meditation. Do you have you taken on something similar since your NDE? I, I, yes and no. Um, I do say that meditation is really good. I find that um, even if I don't do the meditation, I'm finding that I'm living a lot of my life kind of like as though um, I have one foot on each. I mean, I'm pretty grounded when I'm here, but I've been finding that I can access that pretty easily mm. so I do I touch on it like when I when I go to just uh, for a little while before I go to bed or when I wake up in the morning I kind of just release everything and just release everything today and I I just tell myself that I 
not holding on to anything so that I can just allow the day to unfold before me. You're in the world, but not of it. Yeah. Um, I have one final question for you, and this was from the same woman who wrote these other questions, and it'll be a good one to end on because you can sort of go out with a bang, so to speak. Um, <laughs> what is the purpose of human life? Why do you believe we are here? We're here to experience, and it's to experience individuality rather than being part of oneness. And I think only in this state of physical life with duality can we really know who we are. And, and the way to find out who you are really is just to find your joy, do what makes you joyful. When you do what makes you joyful, it means you're in touch with the heart. When you're feeling fear, it means you're coming from the head. Fear only comes from the head. But the more that you learn to do things that make you joyful, the less room there is for fear in your life. And also what I'd like to say to everybody, you know, we're all trying to improve ourselves and trying to uh, constantly, we read self-help books and we follow teachers and gurus and so on. I want everybody to know that actually you are all already what you are trying to attain, but you don't realize it. You are all amazing, magnificent, perfect beings, but we don't realize it. We're born perfect. We spend a lifetime getting it, getting into fear, getting into our dramas, forgetting who we are, and then beating ourselves up for not, um, for not being perfect. Um, in actuality, we are all amazing. So I think people should actually lighten up um, laugh, don't take life so seriously, enjoy yourself and I think the world would be a much better place if we did. Beautiful, thanks Anita. Um, so that's really enjoyable, I love talking to you. Let me, let me just make a, a few concluding remarks and uh, then we'll end it. Um, I've been speaking with Anita Morjani who wrote the book Dying to Be Me I'll, uh, I'll link to her website and her book from batgap.com, her page on batgap.com. Um, and batgap.com is my website where I have all these interviews archived and where I post new ones each week. So if you happen to be listening to this on an audio or something else, go there and you'll see the whole collection. And you can, if you wish, subscribe to an email notification that you'll get once a week when a new interview is posted. Uh, there's also a discussion group there which crops up around each interview and uh, some of those discussions become very very lively so feel free to participate in that. Uh, there's also a link to an audio podcast if you prefer not to sit in front of your computer and <laughs> watch things like this but would like to you know listen while you drive or whatever you can uh, subscribe to the podcast and there's also a donation button which I appreciate people clicking once in a while if possible to help keep the whole thing flowing. So Thanks, Anita. It was great. My pleasure. Thank you for, for having me on. Thank you so much. I enjoyed yeah. it. Good. And thanks to those who have been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.